Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. It's Wednesday. It's our weekly uh, technical forum, WTF, and um, today um, we're still recovering from uh, Shockfest. Uh, at least I know Tim is. Good morning, Tim. How are you? I'm alive. I made it. Another day without meeting the worms. <laughs> <laughs> and and a special guest, special host today, Paul Arford. Good evening. Hi guys. Yeah, you notice that um, he actually has. Th th this is actually natural lighting. It is. Yeah. yeah it's very it's really rare. Yeah, yeah. This is very rare in 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 UK. Um, so we're we're uh, um, um, we're we're back to our our form about um, our format a uh, format that we've been trying out for the last couple of weeks where we're doing a live presentation of a specific topic something that might or might not have been covered um, the idea here is that uh, because it's live we're inviting uh, uh, questions and answers and those those of you who are watching you can either uh, post it why we're doing the presentation or you can even post it ahead of time um, so. Uh, with that, Paul, um, take it away. Okay, thanks, Denny. Um, just let me get my screen share working, make sure I've got this all going. I'm glad it's way, not I, I love, I love those, those, uh, are those uh, wallpaper? I mean, they're beautiful <laughs> behind you. Yeah, are the wallpapers behind me? Yeah, they, you can hardly. I used to. We used to have those here, but I, it's it's. Uh, I don't see them anymore. No, no. So, this is. I'm 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 occupying a, a, one of my daughter's bedrooms who moved out ages ago, and unfortunately, we still got the old wallpaper on the wall. Um, can you see my sh uh, slides? Just to yes. check. Yes. Yes. Perfectly. Okay. Great stuff. Okay, so uh, today I wanted to talk about uh, process monitor. I've been blogging. Uh, on Love My Tool, um, issuing some video blogs looking at Process Monitor and uh, I just wanted to show you quickly how you can extend the capabilities of Wireshark by uh, diving into Process Monitor. So for those of you who don't know anything about Process Monitor, it's a tool you use with um, the Windows operating system. You can use it to trace the activity between an application program and the operating system. So up here with my orange block in this diagram I've got uh, an application program running in a process and it's making calls across the interface to the uh, kernel and I can use process monitor to capture those calls. Particularly registry activity, file IO, TCP and UDP activity and process and thread um, starting and exiting and things like that. The one thing I can't see is I can't see um, keystrokes, mouse movements or screen updates. So I don't see any of that stuff actually running on the on the machine itself but I see all the other activity. So the great news is we can run this across any of the Windows operating systems so on PCs and on servers. It's free for download from the Microsoft site. Uh, the best way to get it is to search for Process Monitor in Google and you'll quickly see the uh, download page and uh, you can download it and have it up and running quite quickly. It's, um, it's really neat and small and it, um, it's a great piece of software as we'll see. So the scenario I'm going to tell you about is one where uh, a customer had a problem with um, a thin client configuration. So they were running applications on Citrix Zenapp servers and the applications were talking or retrieving data from two file servers in the data center or actually one file server in one data center and then a direct image, a replicated image in another data center across a wide area network. Now in the Zenapp environment um, the, the user's application actually runs on the server, so even the desktop, which is uh, the explorer.exe um, program, that runs actually on the Zenapp server. And so the traffic that flows backwards and forwards from the PC to the Zenapp server, uh, that's just presentation services traffic. So we have 
uh, screen refreshes, keystrokes, mouse movements, audio, and a few other bits and pieces, but basically presentation server stuff. Now, the symptoms that the customer had were twofold. Intermittently, the desktop for the users would freeze, uh, so they couldn't use any applications. And when that happened, on the ZenApp server, all the CPUs would max out at 100%. And the second issue was that they noticed that if they opened a large file from the uh, network file servers, um, with using Notepad, Notepad would freeze for a period of uh, time, and that too would cause 100% CPU usage on one CPU of the server. Now, we entered this at a late stage. They'd already decided these two issues were linked, and uh, it was decided that we would investigate the notepad problem, mainly because the notepad problem you could recreate at will, whereas the other problem was uh, more intermittent. So what we did was tools to this environment. We uh, installed Process Monitor on the ZenApp server, and we installed Wireshark DumpCap. So DumpCap was being used to capture network traffic between the ZenApp server and the file server, and Process Monitor to capture that uh, application to operating system uh, interaction. Now, you can run these two tools on a server without problems, but there are configuration uh, considerations. For example, if you Process Monitor can create an awful lot of data. If you output that to the C drive of the server, you're probably going to cause performance issues. So you have to be careful when you do this. And in a later blog, I'll cover the practicalities of uh, using these tools on a, um, on a server. OK, so let's have a look at the problem. Now, we recreated the problem in our lab. We didn't have DFS, but that we'll see that that actually isn't that important. But here you see that we have uh, a text file, which is 100 meg in size, and it's located on a remote file server called Exchange 2010 DC. Uh, this is just something in our test lab. Um, and this is the file we're going to open in Notepad. Um, but before we do that, we're just going to um, quickly start the tools that we need. So we start Process Monitor, and then we start Wireshark. OK, so now we've got those running. Uh, we double click on the actual file. Now, the thing I wanted to show you here, if I just let this wind on a bit, you can see here we're using 12% of an 8 CPU box. So already we're maxing out one of the CPUs. So we let that run, and you can see that Notepad isn't rendering the data yet. This is all still white behind. What I've done here is I've set up a, as soon as the text appears in the Notepad window, I'll send this marker. It will send a ping packet, a single ping packet, across the network to the file server. That packet will have a data length of 101 bytes. The reason for doing that is to make it distinctive, and I'll explain that in a second. So let, let's let this wind forward a bit further. So you can see we've got quite a delay here. Um, so we were able to get the same effect in our lab um, as the customer was experiencing with Notepad. And there you see the data has been rendered. Immediately the data is rendered, the CPU drops to zero. Now, what I should have done is I should have shown you the CPU by process. And in fact, when you looked at the CPU by process, it was the notepad process that was occupying 100% CPU. And nearly all of that time was kernel time. So a lot of activity in the operating system kernel. So we do that. And uh, whoops, sorry, let's let that run. And now I just simply went and stopped the tools. So I don't think we need to watch that. So let's, uh, whoops, let's go back to here. So let's have a look at the traces themselves. I'm going to start with the Wireshark trace. So this is the trace already loaded up. You can see mention of the file that I'm interested in. What I'm going to do is uh, quickly 
filter this trace to just show SMB2 packets. So that's the traffic to the file server. But I also want to see my echo, and my ping. So I filter that traffic. And let's see if we can find the ping itself. And here it is. Let's just check it's the right one. So here you see it's got a data length of 101 bytes. Now the reason that I use a distinctive ping is because your servers and your PCs are being hit with pings over and over again from all the management systems. And so we need something distinctive to uh, make sure we pick out the correct, the correct one. So from here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a find, but I'm going to go backwards through the trace, and I'm going to look for the last SMB read. Now the reason for doing this is that you can imagine if Notepad is going to read this data across the network, then once it's read all the data, you would think that the very next thing it would do would be render the data. So we're going to uh, just look for that read. And here's the read and the read response. And here you see it's this file called bigtextfile.txt. We're reading it at an offset of about 100 meg thereabouts uh, for 24K. Here we see it reading 32K blocks earlier, and then it reads this final one, which is around 22, 23K. OK, now I'm going to uh, filter my trace a bit further in that I'm going to just pick out the read commands. Uh, so I'll prepare that. But I still also want my ping. So let's do that. Filter the trace again. So here we see the ping, which, which you remember I sent the moment that the notepad application rendered the screen. And here you see, uh, sorry, here you see the ping. And here you see the very last read activity. Now what you can see there is there's a quite a big gap there. There's a 15 second or so gap from the time I last read the data across the network to the time that it actually is rendered in the, uh, in the screen in the window. So the initial idea that this was a network problem and there was a there was a lot of belief that it was either a network problem or it was a problem with uh, the fact that we have DFS involved and maybe Notepad is getting the data from the wrong data center or there were all sorts of theories. This all becomes dispelled quite quickly just with this trace. So the question is what happened in, in this 15 seconds? So this is where we can flick into process monitor. Here's my process monitor trace for the same problem. I'm going to look for ping.exe in this trace. I have no idea why that's taking so long. It shouldn't do. It's usually quite quick. Yeah, that's probably okay, so, up. Yeah, yeah. Here's the first mention of ping.exe. And what you can see is it's checking around all the file system to see if there's a ping.com, which there isn't, no such file. Then it checks to see if there's ping.exe, which there is. And so the uh, command uh, process will then spawn off a ping, another process for ping. So I'm going to quickly filter this to pick out just ping. Now I can do it like that just by typing in ping.exe and adding that into my list. And I also want notepad, and in fact, I can just pick it off this list because uh, process monitor has already been through the trace, checked which um, processes and which, which executables are in the trace, and it's picked those out already. So I choose that one. I add that in and apply the trace, and there we've got the ping. And again, you can see there's the last activity from notepad at 204953, and we don't see the ping until 205007. Now that matches, 205007 should match our Wireshark trace, so 205007 in the Wireshark trace. If we back up a bit, we should be able to find the last read request, and here it is, last read at an offset of that for a length of 22 or so K which matches 
the entry we have in the Wireshark trace. So we know we're all in the right area. Um, you can see 2049.52 is the time that lo the last read occurred as far as PROC1 is concerned, and that pretty much matches what we see in the Wireshark trace. So um, that enables us to summarize where we are in this way, which is we see the last read in Procmon. We see the last read response in Wireshark. We then see the last activity that Notepad did for anything in Procmon, which was actually a registry query. Then we've got this big gap, and then we see our ping marker. Half seconds that we have here. So we can go a bit further with Procmon. What we can do, if we come down to where we, we have the uh, long gap, which is just there, just here. Bit there and there. It's an interesting ring time. <laughs> Um, okay, so one of the things that we have is uh, we have this thing called profiling events. And I enabled this when I captured the Procmon trace. And what this means is that every uh, 100 milliseconds or every or 10 times a second, I take a snapshot of the stacks for all the threads that are running in the machine. So I repeatedly keep taking snapshots of the thread stacks. And we can use the thread stacks to see where we've been in the code. So if I, I've, I've already captured that, but unfortunately I've got it filtered out. So if I change the filter, and we can see right here by default, it says event class is profiling exclude. That's why we can't see those events. So if I uncheck that box, and I hit that button there, you can now see all of the thread profiles. process itself. So if we double click on one of these and we have a look at the stack and I hope you can see this because it's hopefully it's showing up on your screen. Um, here we've got the stack trace and we've got things in here that mention language pack. We've got things in here that talk about Uniscribe which I think is converting Unicode text into uh, a text that's renderable on the uh, screen so it's got um, font information, etc. cetera. Uh, so we've got all this going on, and if we step down through here, we see that basically we see the same pattern over and over again. Um, and with a bit more digging around on the internet, what you discover is the way Notepad works is it reads in the whole file, it then converts it into the uh, Windows GDI format to render it into the window, and then it renders it. And, and that high CPU util utilization is simply compute intensive uh, operations sorting out the uh, rendering in the window. So that's the sort of thing we can do with Process Monitor. Um, the conclusions I wanted to draw here, first thing is the problem's not the network, and the problem's not the file server either. The problem is either Notepad itself, Windows, or something to do with the hardware. And the other important thing is, the desktop freeze, the, the, the main problem that we were supposed to be there investigating, had nothing to do with the notepad problem. They were totally unrelated, even though they showed similar symptoms. And um, this goes to my moral that I wanted to draw from this is, don't focus on one symptom and don't link symptoms together. I think that what had happened before we arrived was people were looking for some sort of connection between the notepad issue and the desktop freezes. In fact, we later discovered that the desktop freezes were to do with the configuration of a of the server hardware, in particular, power saving mode on a on a on a file server. It had nothing to do with anything related to the notepad problem. Wow. So that was quick, wasn't it? Went through that rather quickly. Yeah, it it. it um... Very interesting. Me, you know, people see freezes all the time. They don't get a chance to really analyze it. No. And okay. that's pretty cool. Do you uh, do you see? Oh, hang on, I'm not sure if I've got myself off screen yet. No, no you're, you're off. To, you're off you're now, back. Yeah. We can see you. Are you. I'm back. I'm back in the room. Okay, good. Yeah. 
Did you see all of the, you saw everything that I presented? It was a little fuzzy. Okay. Okay. All right. But that could be my eyes. No, that's good. It's useful feedback because obviously it's quite difficult doing a live presentation when perhaps I should use bigger fonts and difficult with the tools as well. But I think you, ma the main thing is to give you the idea. No. Sorry, go on, Tim. No, you did get Wireshark to show up. We've had a problem with that on a regular basis. That's true. Yep. So, I remember Tony struggling with it last week. So you did it, man. You got it up there. Yeah. So I I realize, obviously, and we were chatting a bit about this before the show, but one of the things is that I'm quite aware that the majority of people who visit Love My Tool are networking people. And so, um, you know, as I posted somewhere, I'm skating on the very edge of Love My Tool here um, and pushing the boundaries a bit. But, you know, even as network people, um, we're in a great position to read traces, no matter what the traces are, because lots of people are totally freaked by any form of trace. Um, and, you know, it's just another protocol. It might be in an, inside an operating system, but it's just another protocol. Um, so it's, it's really an extension of uh, Wireshark analysis, etc. Yeah, a lot of people get really carried. They, they see all those lines every packet going back and forth and then right away they're confused they're like oh what you know and filtering has helped as you did as you did you went filter bang 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 because you're yeah. looking for a ping you went to ICMP bang uh, people just have to understand that uh, the filtering is what can save your life definitely and and I often when I'm starting with a trace you know the idea of starting with a 100 megabyte trace and starting from frame number one and just stepping my way through it that's just ridiculous so um, depending on what protocol I'm looking at, say I'm looking at web traffic, I'll start by just looking at all the uh, request method calls. So I'll just see all the gets. Right. And uh, that just gives me a roadmap as to what's happening inside the trace, you know, um, and, and gives me more of an insight. And then I can drill down. So I, I think like you're saying, I think what you're saying is start at the top level and drill down. It's really difficult to start at the bottom and work your way up. It's just impossible. It's too much data. Right. Yeah, yeah. It gets so confusing. I, what, I, scary. what I find, what I, what I take away from this, and I, I find it extremely interesting, is is not just the technical detail what you're doing, Paul, but but the whole philosophy behind it. Yeah. And I think your last uh, slide was very powerful, where you asked, you know, where you said, "Look, don't link symptoms." No, absolutely. And, and I. You know, in my in my previous life as as a as a struggling uh, entrepreneur, and you know, having worked in situations where um, it it it's like a a early stage startup to a late stage startup, and so forth, having to have to deal with people and and people's opinion and and so forth. And the thing that I always talk about is is how you need to really compartment compartmentalize the problem. You know, typically when you when you when you're in the situations, you, you're not solving one problem at a time. You're solving a whole bunch of problems. Some of them um, are new ones and old ones. Some of them, you know, are are pending ones. And and people have a tendency of grouping all of them together and and just hit it with a big hammer. Whereas the, really the only way to do it is to comp compartmentalize it and try to you know try to make sure that they and, and they not um, uh, they can be attacked one at a time and, and the other thing that I always talk about is when you're when you're um, in a in a startup situations um, don't focus on the conclusion so much don't don't make arguments on the conclusion but instead you know argue about the assumption because yeah. that's that's what happens is that people go into a room and their mind is set in the assumptions they're they're not here to discuss about us assum assumptions. That's already done. What they yeah. wanted to do is is talk about a conclusion, and the problem is that you know you got eleven people in the room, you got fifteen conclusions. Yeah, definitely. Right? So the thing to go to do in in my situation is to go back and say, well, let's just look at that assumptions, and what if we what what if that assumption is incorrect, right? Yeah. And I think yeah. that's that's a big thing I took away from your philosophy is that. 
is that um, it is so easy when you especially I, I suspect I suspect in your profession when you when you if 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 your customers could solve the problem they already solve it you wouldn't even be there. Yeah. So I you're coming in, you know, after a lot of um, investment has already been made. Much of the investments are emotional. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think I think the point I would make there is that it's natural for people to look for patterns, especially in the early stages of uh, solving a problem. So, for example, you might say, "Well, we only see the problem in New York. We don't see the problem in Boston. It must be something to do with the New York office." Now that's a reasonable assumption to a level, but if you get into deep dive type stuff, you should never work on lots of linked symptoms and, and those sorts of pattern based methods because you're starting out with the assumption that they've all got one root cause and just by that thought process, you're going to spend all your time trying to figure out what the link is between all these different symptoms when maybe they're not linked. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you a, a Great example. A couple of years ago, we went to look at um, some IP telephony problems at a bank. They were rolling out a new IP telephone system, uh, really big deployment, got up to about 8,000 users and started to have lots of problems. When we arrived, they had two tickets open. One was for uh, voice uh, dropouts, and the other one was for voice quality issues. So call dropouts and voice quality, rather. And when we unpicked all of the symptoms, there were 52 different symptoms and 18 root causes. Now you imagine, you started with two. You, and if you had spent, and they were, they were spending all their time trying to explain, why do we get this whole range of voice quality issues? What's the common factor? Well, there wasn't one. That's the point. So it's a really dangerous way to go. That's, and I, I mean, it's, it's a way we never, Advanced 7 never works that way because we'd be crucified by our customers, quite honestly, if we tried it, because uh, it's just too unreliable. Well, be before we started the show, we were talking about uh, ShockFest, and we were talking about this presentation called the ShockBite, and, and, you know, how the, and, 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 and we we're going to be posting that on Love My Tool, and one of the comments that Tim made is that, you know, if you could bottle that energy, um, you, can, you, can, you can really sell that for a lot of money, but I think, in a sense, what we're doing here is, you know, and and this is you and Paul, you Paul and Tim, um, you guys have a lot of experience, and you guys have a lot of ways, uh, you know, in the right ways and wrong ways of solving problem. And all, all we're trying to do here is is to bottle that experience, right, and and see if we it makes sense to someone. And yeah. the thing that we always know, and and before I was an entrepreneur, I was a university professor for nine years, and so I know how how we educate young people, right. So you know the formal education. In the formal education, what we try to do is we always try to non-dimensionalize the problem, and then we always have a unified theory for everything, right? And so what happened is that um, a lot of people, a lot of technical people, uh, that's what intelligence people do. You know, they look at ten symptoms. They say, well, there has to be a unified theory. Mm. There has to be a one solution. This is what intelligent people do. Right? It's it's not enough yeah. that they solve the problem. They have to solve it in a very intelligent way. Um, well, I'm I'm not I'm not I'm not against generalized approaches. So we're working at the moment on a generalized trace analysis uh, guide. So this is a way where you can analyze any set of traces to uh, find uh, the root cause of a problem, and it's just stepping you through some steps. Now, when you get down to the detail and the specifics of the protocol analysis and what data you've collected and all of that, of course it's all going to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. I, I haven't got a problem so much with that generalized approach. I've got a problem with making an assumption at the start of an investigation that I've got five symptoms. They all started at the same time, so they must be linked. And then what you find out is when you get to the, bo the, the root cause of one of those problems, you find that suddenly people start to say to you, actually, you know what, They're not all, they didn't all start happening at the same time. I remember we used to get this problem last year or a couple of months ago. And there's a lot, the problem with any pattern-based method is you have to have perfect input information. And if any of it's imperfect, and so often in any organization, the information you get is imperfect, the whole thing falls apart. Right. So for example, the example I gave about New York and Boston, if 
you say New York users get the problem, Boston users don't, then later you find out actually Boston users do get the problem, they just don't report it, or they don't use that part of the system, or they don't care, or it's just what they've come to expect and they've given up reporting it, you know? So it's really fraught with danger using that type of approach. That's why we. That's why Advanced 7 never does it, uh, yeah. because we just we couldn't deliver a reliable service um, yeah. if we did it that way. No, that that's terrific, Paul. So um, maybe we should just close the show and then and then uh, we can talk offline about something else. Um, I, I wanted to to see if um, we we talk about the presentation that uh, Tim made uh, at Shockfest. Um, the 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 uh, I I wonder if we can expand on that. But anyway, we do that offline. But I I think um, I I I I I like to summarize um what I learned today uh from Paul, which is don't just question the expert. Don't just question the authority. Question the assumption. Yeah. Is that is that about right, Paul? Yeah, yeah. Don't yeah. Don't start from the point where you you you've got no evidence and just based on some sort of loose observation you've decided two things are linked. That's yeah. that's really dangerous. Yeah. That's, that's, like you know, that's like having a leak in your car oil and turn out the differential. I mean it just yeah. people do that so often because we are associative think we do associative thinking. Denny pointed that out is that that's our common way. We it, but a oh, good yeah. troubleshooter doesn't do that. A good no, troubleshooter it's, it's, tries to dichotomize it, yeah. just like a doctor does. He doesn't go after tearing up your 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 whole viscera trying to find something wrong that's with your gallbladder. Okay. Yeah. I mean, what? How would you like it if the doctor, um, you know, if you if you go to a doctor's office and 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 you explain to him you know, what you think the problems are, and and th and then they they'll start doing an operation right after that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> based on happened, based on your assumption. happened to me. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, um, again, you know, my in my uh, entrepreneur's days, um, one of the keys to success in running a startup is to understand that there are two kinds of people out there. Hmm. Both of them are important. Two kinds of engineers. Both are important. There's one kind of engineers who who likes to beat the problem into submission. Right, you tell them that this is what the problem is. They just beat it to death until they get until 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 they find a solution. Uh, those are great. I mean, there's nothing wrong with them. But on the other hand, what my experience is that in a startup, you want people that um, that solve the problem by by redefining the, the 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 problem, right? Don't solve it, right? But instead of redefining, so again. Just question the assumption. I think that's uh, that's what we're trying to do. That's that's a, that's if anything, that's the wisdom that we're trying to bottle today. Sounds good. Okay, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Tim. And uh, stay stay online so we can have a discussion. Thanks again, everyone. And uh, see you next week. And go out there and do good. Bye bye.